Hello, I am Reverend Irene Smith, and I'd like to welcome you to Generationally Speaking. Here at the table, we come and we discuss life issues, no matter what they might be. As we sit at the table with each generation, we all learn, we all grow, we all are inspired. Yeah, yeah. Generationally Speaking. Hello, I am Reverend Irene Smith, and I want to welcome you to Generationally Speaking. It is at the table where we sit together, where we grow and we learn, hearing the voices from every generation. And you know, I am so excited. I know, I know you say Reverend Smith always excited. Well, I am. God just continues to bless. And today is no exception. I am so excited to introduce to you uh, Dr. Charles Mugusha. And I'm just excited about uh, what God is doing in his life. And I want to first welcome him uh, to Generationally Speaking. Welcome, Dr. I don't, thank you, Reverend Smithy. It's really beautiful to be here and to visit with you in Maryland. Yeah. And so, Dr. Charles, just for my audience's sake, tell us a little bit about uh, where, you, where, where you grew up, what, was, what life was uh, like for you during those early years of your life, and the community and those persons, your parents and those persons who were around you, what was it that now when you look back you can say certainly they helped to form these thoughts, these beliefs of mine? Wow. My upbringing in Paul Sibley is very different from most of you, my listeners, especially here in the U.S. I was born and raised up by two refugee parents. Wow. So my mom and my dad uh, are natives of Rwanda. And in 1959, they had to leave their home country. Mm -hmm and run away because of the genocide against the Tutsi. Yeah. So I was raised up as a refugee okay. in the country of Uganda. Yeah. And I remember um, as a younger kid, actually I didn't know any of my family members. Mm. All I knew was mom and dad. And I felt fortunate to have a mother and a father, but no family members wow. uh, because of um, where they were coming from. So I was raised up as a refugee boy. I, I want to stop right there because I want our audience to be able to grasp this thought of a refugee. Here in America, um, it's foreign to us uh, what he's saying and what he experienced as a young child. So being a refugee means that you leave the country of your origin. And in leaving, uh, not only did he leave the country of his origin, but also his uh, immediate family. And you are you're taking in, I guess, by other, other folk, or they, they brought you with them? Um, my, I was born mm -hmm. in Uganda okay. to refugee parents. Oh, okay, right. Yes, uh, they left the country when mm -hmm. they were younger people. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was taken in by his friends who were able to run away before anybody left the country. So he was like a second group of the people who left the country. And the first group that left was able to welcome him. And actually, the gentleman who welcomed him ended up his, being his brother-in-law. Wow. So wow. that is the, the story. And he, uh, fortunately, Dad was able to establish a life mm -hmm. in a fallen country, and in that fallen country, raised seven children. Wow, wow. So I remember my father as a very resilient man, very hard worker mm -hmm. to support his family. My mom was a very hard worker. Mm -hmm. Basically, dad would go work all day, and mom would go work all evening. Mm. 
So raising a family where both parents had to go work to make it, uh, to make life for us mm -hmm. in an environment with no relatives, no grandparents, no, no, no uncles, but make life right. work. Mm -hmm. And in an environment where we had limited opportunities, very limited opportunities, because if you are not a native very early in life, the opportunities were very little. But dad was a great guy, great man. He would always go out looking for opportunities for us. And that's how we are raised up with a family, with a mother and a father who actually worked hard to provide opportunities for us in spite of what was happening around themselves. It seemed like they wanted to shield us mm -hmm. from what had happened to them and give us some kind of a more stable life. Wow, what a wonderful uh, legacy to have and a great foundation that you have to build on. Tell us about your education. You know, I had the opportunity, possibly many younger people of my days did not have. And uh, I had the opportunity, which was unlocked by a pastor. Mm -hmm. A pastor led me to Jesus Christ mm -hmm. at the age of 17. Wow. And God used his church and the community of the church to actually help me go back to school. So I had the opportunity to go to college <laughs> and I got a college degree and then in the middle of amazing circumstances. Some people brought me to the US and I got my master's degree at Mount Noma University All in right. Portland, Oregon. Yeah. And then finally got my doctorate at Gordon Conwell. All right. All right. So it wasn't an easy journey. There's so much in between. But I'm so grateful yeah. to my parents, to the church, and to a number of missionaries yeah. and a number of good people who invested in my life yeah. to be where I am right now. I can just imagine that when you came over to the United States with the opportunity to uh, pursue a higher education, you must have felt the weight of responsibility for those who were supporting you in this effort to get an education, to get that college uh, education. Did you feel any of that weight on your shoulders? You know, for me, I think the responsibility was more of the responsibility for those I've left behind. Yeah. I felt like, okay, I got the opportunity, possibly most of mm. the people I've left behind will never get. Mm -hmm. They will never go to graduate school. Mm. They will never get a, a doctorate. In fact, while I was here and I was studying, I started a ministry called Africa New Life Ministries because I was already thinking about the children I left home. Wow. Because uh, to make the story short, uh, actually, finally, our home country of Rwanda, which my father had left uh, in 1959, in 1994, even had a greater tragedy. A million people were killed uh, in 90 days. Yeah. This, the genocide against yeah. the Tusi uh, people of Rwanda. And coming from that background and coming to America, I felt a responsibility that I needed to go back to Rwanda and help right. and redevelop the country. So while I was here, I had a great opportunity to study, to network, to develop relationships and start a ministry, which I now do in Rwanda. Wow. You know, when you talk about what happened uh, in Rwanda, we interviewed a young man, uh, Dr. Fideas, and uh, he shared his experience. And he is now in California, but he's never spoken of going back. Mm. And when I hear you uh, saying, I'm, I'm going back there to start a ministry, uh, I'm sure things had changed by then in, in terms of, of the genocide that was occurring? You know, the genocide stopped in 1994. Okay. I moved from Uganda to Rwanda 1995, <laughs> just, at just at the end of the genocide. 
actually dead bodies. Oh. We are still smiling everywhere, incomplete barriers, massy graves, um, thousands and thousands of children heaped up in orphanages, really, really not a, a good life, a broken education system. The whole country was in misery. Yeah. But I remember when I entered that country, <laughs> one of the two things, either free and go and never come back, or do something about the situation. This is the hour. God is calling you to do it. And if you don't do it, God is going to use other people mm -hmm. to do it. So for me, I felt like I'm not going to just run away from the country. I need to stay. We are the generation that stays here. I don't blame everyone who has never come back or who is not coming back or who is living in any other country. But I felt that was a personal assignment. Mm -hmm. For me, it was the feeling of Nehemiah. Yes. Rebuilding. Uh, rebuilding the walls. Yes. Jerusalem is broken. Yeah. And Nehemiah, you can make a decision to stay in, 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 in exile, there's some level of comfort. Mm -hmm. You're working in the king's palace. For me, in that situation, I was in America, and the American life was good <laughs> and not bad. Yeah. I had two of my kids with me, but I still felt the burden and the responsibility to be part of rebuilding a nation. <laughs> and that's how we decided for me and my wife to go back to Rwanda and start African New Life. All right. Yeah. So tell us uh, what your mission and your purpose was when you went back uh, with this, uh, this ministry, uh, Africa New Life. Were you, did you have financial support? Were you uh, concerned about the safety of your family and how people would receive you? I was not really uh, concerned about how people would receive me mm -hmm. because I'd been in the country for some time. I'd built relationships. Okay. I had made some friendships. I was concerned about the security of my family. Mm -hmm. I was concerned about resources for us to live in the country. But again and again, I had this confirmation from God mm -hmm. that God would take care of us, mm -hmm. that God would provide for mm -hmm. us, that God would protect us. Yeah. And uh, um, I am a person of faith. I believe that when God calls, he gives you the grace. And we've seen the grace through these years. Mm -hmm. But during our stay here, in the U.S., God helped us to develop a network of partners and support. So we actually had some support yeah. to start the journey, but not too much. In fact, when we started the journey of starting a ministry in Rwanda, we started with our own money. Okay. Uh, when I was going to seminary, my wife would babysit children. And we had a family that provided a basement for us to live in. And we would also take care of their children and their house. And my wife saved the money, hoping that one day when we return to Rwanda, we can use the money to buy a piece of property and build our own home. Being a pastor's wife, she will find safety in having her own mm -hmm. home because mm -hmm. you don't know where the next meal is going to come from. You don't have a promise of a salary. So having a home was a form of comfort for our family. But when we first returned to Rwanda during our stay here in the U.S., that was year 2001, we felt God telling us to give away the money we had saved for our own house. Mm. Mm. So um, I remember turning to my wife and I said, honey, can we give away that money we've <laughs> saved to start a, a preschool for kids uh, so that these kids can find a yeah. place they can come to every day to learn, to eat, mm -hmm. but also to find relief from their struggles. And I remember my wife didn't hesitate. 
She said, you can have the money. Yeah. So I got the money, started a small preschool with the 20, 90 students, see? Uh, bought a few pieces of furniture, hired a teacher for $40, <laughs> see? And uh, that was the best summer ever in my life. And I returned to America to go to school. I remember when we arrived in America. I said in my heart, if anybody never supports, if nobody ever supports see, any of these children, I'm going to work every day. Mm -hmm. And I'll send some money to them. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, a number of people came on in a big way. We found a lot of help. And in less than two months, see, all the 29 kids were sponsored. Wow. You know, when you say that, you know, that really is... Uh, act of faith. And I think God is calling us to step out on faith because that's what you had. It wasn't so much the, the undergirding that was there, but it was faith. And to see you plant that seed and watch God bring the increase. It's just amazing. Oh, the increase has been enormous. Yeah. Right now, 11,000 children are sponsored by African New Life. Wow. From a seed of 29 to 11,000. Now, are they all there in, uh, uh, in that one area of Africa? Or are they spread out? In fact, they are all spread out in the nation of Rwanda. We work okay. in the nation Rwanda. of Rwanda. Okay. And right now, we run... 12 of campuses. Wow. And these children are scattered on different campuses mm -hmm. all over the country in the communities where we serve. That is such a blessing. So how did you, how are you able to establish these um, various campuses and, uh, you know, selecting the people to, to, that you could trust to, to, to run the campuses? Are these pa other pastors that you partnered with? Uh, we've planted churches. Okay. And we've planted uh, already 10 churches. Okay. We are working on planting uh, more two churches and more churches. Uh, so we've actually developed uh, from one campus, mm -hmm. one pastor, mm -hmm. at that moment just me and my wife. And gradually, God has brought on more people. African New Life is uh, a full organization. Yeah. When I was living in the States here, I started the 501c3. Okay. okay. So it, through that 501c3, mm -hmm. people have supported the ministry in big ways. And then, you know, with all the education and the skills and the grace of God, I went home and started developing teams, mm -hmm. hiring people, mm -hmm. casting vision. Uh, it's an entire organization now. We have over 400 people who work for African New Life Ministries in different sectors. Because we're in the sector of faith, we're in the sector of education, we're in the sector of women empowerment, okay. and the medical work. Wow. I, I have a, a pastor friend uh, in Uganda, and he talked about, uh, you know, he started uh, the ministry. They had a building, and um, the resistance burned it down. But he said it didn't stop him. He got back up and God, uh, God provided. So have you met any of that type of resistance as you've grown forward? You know, Rwanda is a great country. Mm -hmm. It's really possibly one of the best countries on the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. And I would say the best one in the sense that uh, the government of Rwanda is very cooperative okay. with people who want to develop the country. Okay. You remember, we all came in so broken. Mm -hmm. The country went so down to like a bottomless sea, so down to the bottom of the pit that we had nowhere to go any further. So anyone who came in with their hands to help make things better had incredible support. Uh, from the government. We've had our own challenges. We've had our own needs. But I would say we've had a great support and collaboration with the government to enter into new communities, to, to start schools. We've started a number of schools to start a hospital. We've gone through challenges, but it's been a good country for us to be in. The nation realizes that African New Life is contributing immensely to the transformation mm. of Rwanda. 
and Rwanda as a nation is a very positive nation. We want to see transformation. Yeah. We have good leadership, and our good leadership wants to see transformation. So when you come in and you are doing things right, <laughs> they don't accommodate <laughs> doing things wrong, doing things right, you're going to find right leaders yeah. who want to partner with you yeah. to change the country. I want to talk uh, to my audience a little bit because I think sometimes we don't always um, uh, just know fully the beauty of uh, different uh, countries. And um, Dr. Fadea is one of my uh, previous guests. He shared with us just the topography, the different topography that there is in uh, Rwanda. And I was just amazed. So tell us a little bit about if people come to visit, the, some of the sites that they can really, the, the topography of the land that uh, they can just appreciate. Rwanda has a beautiful habitation for the gorillas. Yes. In fact, people are traveling from all over the world to come to Rwanda to see gorillas. We are very mountainous, yes. beautiful and green. Yes. We have a national park. We, we have a number of good um, uh, uh, touristic things to see, but let me tell you the most beautiful thing about Rwanda is the soul of the people <laughs> of Rwanda. And I'll tell you why. You know, going through the genocide of 1994 mm -hmm. against the Tutsi people of Rwanda, going through years of hatred and bitterness and fights and uh, all the troubles we've gone through, no one ever imagined that the soul of Rwanda as a nation would ever be redeemed. Yeah, yeah. And that once again, we would be one mm. people living yeah. in one country yeah. where a Hutu person and a Tutsi person can live in the same area, go to the same schools, go to the same churches, go to work together, mm -hmm. serve in the same government. What we have seen in Rwanda, the soul of the people of Rwanda, their willingness to forgive, to reunite, mm -hmm. to form a nation again that was broken. Yeah. The soul of Rwanda is beautiful. So when you ever come to Rwanda, you will enjoy to see the soul of the people of Rwanda and their resiliency and their willingness to forgive, to live, and to work together again. All right. So you're here visiting. Are you here visiting? Yes, I'm here visiting. I visited the U.S. about two, three times a year, okay. uh, preaching and working with our U.S. organization. We've just finished a board meeting in Portland, Oregon. Okay. We gather every year two times to plan for the ministry, but also to network mm -hmm. and invite our, our friends in the U.S. to support the children, sponsor children. So I go around churches, encouraging, encouraging churches to sponsor children, invite mission trips, yeah. give the church yeah. in the U.S. an opportunity <laughs> to grow in their mission or discipleship yeah. life. So that's what I do when I come to America. So talk to us, uh, the audience, about what uh, individuals can do and what their respective churches or their uh, different organizations that they are involved in can do to support uh, Africa New Life. No, Africa New Life who continues to develop Rwanda. We continue to, to, to make a difference in that country. And the way I would say it, we are a ministry of the two hands of the gospel, which is proclaim the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ and at the same time act compassionately in the community and do these things together at the same time, bring the two hands of the gospel together at the same time. Mm -hmm. So when you come to Africa New Life, you're going to find out that we are planting churches, we are educating pastors, and providing a college education for the pastors. For the pastors there? There. Okay. Now, you talk about a burden and a responsibility when I came here. 
I felt that I had the responsibility to go back and train and train the pastors <laughs> and provide an education for them. And right now, we run Africa College of Theology, okay. and we train the pastors and equip them with a college degree over there in Rwanda, and they are learning and growing. Wow. The college is now 400 students. And I would invite churches to support us. Mm -hmm. Running a college is not something easy. It costs a lot of money, and uh, most of those pastors can't afford to pay for their college. Right. So I would invite uh, pastoral college education sponsorship in a Bible college. But then we're also growing our child sponsorship. Mm -hmm. The need uh, continues to be <laughs> big. And uh, we want to go into more communities uh, yeah. and sponsor children. Yeah. And I would invite individuals and churches to come on board. Maybe invite us to their church to do a Dream Sunday. The Dream Sunday is actually about coming to the church, teaching them what it means to sponsor a student and what that does for the student and provides an education, provides food, provides medical care, provides discipleship. And we would love to see many, many churches sponsor children with African New Life Ministries. We have a women's ministry okay. and women can be empowered through African New Life. My wife runs a family center okay. where women go through a discipleship process, counseling, they learn a new trade like sewing and hairdressing. Yes, yeah. So we have a hair designing yeah. wow. academy for women who have dropped out of school to be able to, to pick on a new skill and start out their lives. We really do a comprehensive ministry within 12 communities wow. of Rwanda.